Tom King. This is Daniel Stubblefield. We're partners over at Boston Mountain Brewing and Supply. We've been in operation for uh, four years. Last month is when our anniversary was. And uh, we've just combined with Daniel's Home Brew Shop in January. So we now provide any kind of brewing equipment. We do these classes and basically just try to help the community learn how to brew and uh, brew as efficiently and as possible. How's that? You guys hear me all right? All right, good. So let's see, first slide we got here is presentation goals. We're gonna, by the end of this presentation, we're hoping to be able to, uh, for you guys to be able to identify what makes beer, the basic equipment involved in brewing beer at home. And we we'll, might go over some of the scaled up versions that are in the breweries and stuff like that, just so you can get some comparisons. And then the basic brewing process from picking out your grains, building your recipe, your hops, your yeast, whatever you need to use to get a certain style of beer going for yourself. And uh, we figured we'd pick up from the very start of things here with the uh, origin, the history of beer. Hey so, Matt, I want to ask real quick, not to, sure. not to cut you off. Who here has already brewed beer before? Now, did you say you, you have or haven't brewed beer before? Gotcha. Okay. Kind of just kind of get familiar with some of the people that already kind of know parts of the process and who doesn't know parts of the process. And also before we actually get started on the history and all the equipment, if y'all have any questions, ask it right then. Uh, because usually if you go on a couple more minutes, you might forget your question. Uh, so we have no problem if y'all raise your hand, be like, hey, we've got a question on this. We try to answer it right then instead of going on and then trying to come back to it. So feel free to ask any questions that y'all have right when you get to it. If it pops in your head, just and we'll do our best to answer it right there for you. Absolutely, we'll keep it as informal as possible here. So the history of beer, you know, it started about 10,000 years ago during the agricultural revolution. It's actually, they think, the first alcoholic beverage that human beings have ever, were ever producing. Um, it originated in Mesopotamia, like I said, about 10,000 years ago by the Sumerians. It probably started as a um, like grain that they had harvested. They began to agriculturalize the process and uh, they would notice that if you got your grain wet in a container, it would begin to ferment and produce alcohol. Um, it evolved from there. China is actually where one of the oldest known recipes comes from. It's dated about 5000 BC. And then the Egyptians were also very heavy into making beer. There's some of the recipes we've gotten actually out of the pyramids and other locations uh, about 3,000 years ago. A lot of these civilizations used it for religious practices. It was also used in a lot of these places as a currency. In fact, the Egyptians often paid their laborers in beer. Um, and when we're talking about this beer, it's probably it's nothing like what we have today. The Egyptian, they've recreated the Egyptian recipes is very thick red and had uh, antibiotic properties. And they would pay, there's written hieroglyphics that said that they would pay their laborers with about 10 pints a day of this stuff. And it was actually codified into law. If you're familiar with Hammurabi out of Mesopotamia, Hammurabi's law, it's actually written in there that everyone was supposed to be supplied with a certain amount of beer every day. Very interesting stuff if you're into beer anyway. So and that's how they built the pyramids. Awesome. And that's how they built the pyramids. Drunk, drunk Egyptians the, build the pyramid. <laughs> yeah, built on beer. So from there it progressed. And a lot of times, you know, back in the day, they would not use uh, a lot of the ingredients that we would use. Hops, in fact, were not introduced until the Middle Ages. Um, and before that, they would use a lot of herbs and different ingredients like that to flavor the beer. So uh, when you think about beer today, you're thinking about our classical IPAs, our lagers, our stouts, porters, a lot of that stuff wasn't around back then. They would smoke the grain most of the time over a campfire after placing it into water. So I guess I should go into that a little bit. The uh, process of 
making beer begins with the harvesting of the grain and a process called malting. So you take your barley, typically is what you're talking about when you're making a grain, although we use different, you can use corn, you can use rice, but those, those different grains will undergo a different process. They won't be malted. So the malting process is where you will take the grain and you will put it into a container or uh, sometime, like today, they'll use large racks where they'll spread the grain out and they'll spray it with water. And that will allow the grain to germinate just slightly to where the, uh, I believe it's called a cotyledon, will start to come out of the grain and then they will roast it immediately to stop that process. And that will trap the sugars that the plant would use in the germination process within the grain. And that is those sugars are where you will get your alcohol. So you will, uh, once that process is complete, that takes about two years. Once they germinate it and they stop it and roast it, they'll put it in large concrete underground uh, vats and they'll age it for two years and then they'll put it out on the market, which is where you will buy it and you will take it and you will crush it, which will allow you to access the sugars within that grain. Um, and you'll, uh, once you uh, get to that process, you will put it into what we would call a mash tun. So a mash tun is basically a large container, similar to the boil kettle that you see here on the right. It will be a metal or plastic kettle with a false bottom in the bottom and you will put your grain in there. You will fill it up with water at a certain temperature and that will uh, allow that, those sugars to be extracted from the grain. And then you will pull that, what you, what you would then call wort, off of the bottom of the kettle and transfer that to your boil kettle. And I may be going too fast here. What do you think? Uh, possibly. Okay, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, uh, we can start with uh, uh, just the four basic things that you need to make a beer. Uh, the Germans passed this purity law, I don't know the year. I think it was in the 1500s. Somewhere around there to where you cannot consider a beer a beer unless it has these four basic ingredients, which is water, yeast, barley, and hops. If you put anything else in that, into whatever you're making, they will say it's not a beer. So uh, that's kind of where today's more traditional beer that you're drinking kind of comes from, is from the German purity law. It's uh, Rathausgebot, is that how they pronounce it? Somewhere around there? Close enough. Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, that's, uh, like I said, that's more of today's beer that you're drinking. It usually has to have at least those four things in it for it to actually be a beer, which would be water, barley, hops, and yeast. The four things that make today's beer. So uh, off that, uh, we started with grain. Do you want to go over two hops and just go off of our... Uh, if you want to, sure, absolutely. So, uh, has anybody ever... I'm, I've passed around some uh, little packages of grain. They have, I don't know, hundreds of different varieties of grain now. Everywhere from here's a chocolate wheat to chocolate malt to pale ale to brown to base malts to anything you can think of to flavor your beer however you'd want to flavor it. Uh, the same kind of goes with hops these days as well. You can get hops from all over the world. Uh, certain hops from different parts of the world will give you different flavors of hops. Some have super fruit flavors, some have more piney resinous flavors. Uh, and the same kind of goes with yeast now too. They have specific yeast now for sp specific styles of beers. You can actually get a yeast for whatever style of beer uh, that you ever think about brewing. If you want to do a lager, they have yeast just for lager. If you want to do a Kolsch style beer, they have yeast just for Kolsch's. This one itself is for a Belgian wit, so a Belgian wheat beer. Uh, anything you can think of nowadays. And they make it reasonably easy to make a beer. It's just uh, the process, which we're going to get to here in a minute, is kind of where things kind of get confusing and where you could easily mess up. But. And that's one thing about it today is it's a lot easier to brew today than it ever has been before, so it's a lot more accessible to people. And going back to the grain and the malting process, and that's usually where you start when you start to build a recipe for yourself, is you're going to start, first you want to know exactly how much of the beer you're going to make, and you'll have a vessel similar to this which will restrict exactly how much you are able to make. It has graduations on the side, up to five gallons on this one in particular. 
So you don't want to go above the five gallon mark or you're going to have a mess on your hands basically because during the fermentation process you're going to get a lot of foam. It's called a crossin on top of it and that will spill out over the top of it if you don't allow enough head space here. So you would start your the initial, the initial process by determining exactly how much beer you want to make and then the style of the beer that you want to make is another factor that you want to consider. So if you're going to produce something like an IPA or a lager, Pilsner or something like that, you're going to go for grains that are lighter in, uh, in uh, color. So during the malting process that we were discussing earlier, after the grain is allowed to germinate and then it is roasted, it is roasted at different temperatures for different periods of times and it produces these different colors in the grains. And that will dictate exactly what the color of your beer is going to be once it is completed. So if you're going to produce a, say a stout, then you want to throw something like this chocolate wheat into it that will color that beer and, and make it a darker colored beer, which is what typically a stout is identified as. But you're also going to consider, and I don't know how this is introduction to home brewing, so I don't know how technical we want to get into it, but the longer that you roast the grain and the darker the grain is, the less extractable sugars you're going to get out of that grain as well. And the extractable sugars are what's going to dictate the alcohol content in your finished product. So. Typically when you're building a recipe, you'll start with something like a two row, which is like this right here. Uh, this is called a base malt actually, but it's a two row barley. So when the plant is growing, it produces two rows of grain is basically all that, that means. There's six rows as well. And uh, the bulk of your recipe is gonna be made up of this base malt because it has a large amount of extractable sugar in it. So, and then when you add your adjuncts in, or which are these darker ones, you're going for color, you're going for mouthfeel. Um, what else would you say? Uh, head retention, exactly. like, uh, have y'all ever, uh, say, poured two different beers and you'll see the foam cap on top of a beer. Some are really thick, some aren't almost there at all, even though both the beers are carbonated. Uh, there are certain grains that will actually cause that head retention to stay with your beer from the beginning you start drinking it all the way to the end. And I'm sure everybody's had a beer where you've actually seen that lacing around the glass. Like every time you take a drink, it almost leaves like a lacing of, of like your foam. That could be from some grains that people put in. Like I like to put carapils in a lot of the beers I brew. It's really good with head retention and it kind of keeps that like one finger width, you know, uh, foam on top of your beer as you drink it. So grains can also do stuff like that to your beer as well. And that, that varies across style as well, but it's typically a desired um, factor that you want to consider when you're producing these beers is how much head retention and how much mouthfeel. Obviously a craft beer like a stout is going to have a thicker mouthfeel and that's what we mean when we say mouthfeel, whereas like a lager will be a cleaner, crisper, yeah. not so much of that thickness to it. And then, uh, uh, you know, he's talking about head retention. When you're talking about the foam, that's what you consider the head of the beer. And there's certain beers that have a smaller head than a, than a larger one, obviously. Um, like a stout, for example, I keep going back to the stout, but the stout typically has less than a finger width of head on it if you're going for a classical style. Whereas something like a Pilsner, like a German Pilsner, you pour that sucker with like two or three inches ahead and allow that to dissipate over time. Yeah. So that's the basics of where you're going to start your process for brewing a style of beer is to determine the style and then build your recipe based on the grains that you have and the color and the mouthfeel and the head retention that you want to get out of that. Everybody kind of understand why we have malt and beer. All right, we're going to move on to hops. So we'll do hops and why hops are good for a beer. Uh, hops are used for numerous things in beers as well. Uh, not only do they give you your, uh, let me get out of the way here, your bitterness for your beer. They can also give you different aromas for your beer. Uh, they can do many different things. Uh, it says right there, it provides aroma, bitterness, adds flavor to your beer. Uh, how you get certain bitterness to beer, how you get more aroma to beer. There's 
all kinds of different processes you use. Uh, we can go over that here uh, in a minute, unless y'all want to go over it now. It's really simple uh, to explain. Like say, when you're brewing your beer, you've already got your grains mashed in. You've already rinsed your sugars off your grains. Your next process is to bring it up to a boil because we're going to get all that extra water out of your wort and try to just consolidate that sugars down. You're just trying to get more and more sugars. Uh, hops, uh, depending on when you put your hops into your boil for your beer will determine how bitter your beer is going to be, how not bitter it's going to be, how more aroma or flavor you're going to get, and how much you're not going to get. So the basic rule of thumb when it comes to hops in beer, the longer they boil, the more bitter your beer is going to be. The less time they boil, the less bitter it's going to be, and you're going to get more aroma. So just remember that next time, or if y'all ever decide to brew any beer, uh, that, that's kind of the best rule of thumb. If you want a super bitter beer like a West Coast IPA, you know how most of those, like sometimes people say they taste like pine cones or something, you know, yeah. very resinous and stuff like that. that. They're putting a lot of hops in at the beginning of the boil and they're boiling it out. Uh, and that'll give you more bitterness. Uh, if you like the new trendy hazy IPAs, uh, they're only throwing them in, say, maybe a 20 minute, maybe 15 minute mark where they're only boiling them that long, not like a full hour like a West Coast. And then if you've seen the hazies actually say like double dry hopped, they're actually not boiling the hops at all. They're just throwing the hops in uh, your fermenter once you're already in, in like high crowds and high fermentation. And so we can go over that here a little bit too as we go over some of the equipment as well. Just to elaborate on that too a little bit, when, you, when, when you're done with your mashing process and you're going to your boil kettle, the typical boil time of a beer is around 60 minutes. Some people do it about 90 minutes. So when he's saying, you know, the longer you boil it or when you put it in at the beginning of the boil, he's meaning you're boiling those hops for the entire 60 minutes typically. Yeah, that, that, that's a, your basic time of boiling is 60 minutes. You, they usually do a 60 minute mash and a 60 minute boil. You can boil as long as you want when it comes to it. I mean, the more you boil, the less water you're gonna have in and the more sugar. So if you're shooting for say a real high ABV uh, beer, uh, ABV of course stands for alcohol by volume, uh, the longer you boil it, it's not going to hurt. All it's going to do is create more sugars. Uh, and we actually, uh, we do have a local homebrew club here in Fayetteville. Uh, that was one thing that we were talking about just at this last meeting is mash time. Is how long should I mash in my grains to get all of my sugars out of it. And uh, one uh, video that I was showing them over that, it turns out that 40 minutes you are actually got about your full sugars out of all your grains in about 40 minutes. But depending on your certain adjunct grains that you throw in there, it could, that time could go a little bit longer. But say if you're just doing a, a, a single base grain, it, usually about 40 minutes you can get all your sugars you need on a mash time. As well as mash thickness, I would think, would play a large role in yeah. that as well. So when you're mashing, the typical average amount of water that you add into the grain is about 1.5 quarts of water per pound of grain. And that'll give you a good mid-range mouthfeel. And that's another factor. I mean, we're getting kind of complicated here, and I don't want to overwhelm you guys with too much information, but the mouthfeel can also be influenced by the amount of water that you add into the grain. So the thicker that the mash is, meaning the less water to grain ratio that you have, the greater the mouthfeel is going to be in the finished product as well. So the, and, and then the opposite is true as well, whereas you add more water into the grain and create a thinner mash, you're gonna get a thinner product at the end. So depending on the style, again, I'll go back to stouts, they're gonna have a thicker mash. They're gonna probably be around 1.2, 1.3 quarts of water per gallon, whereas something like a Pilsner or, or any kind of lager is gonna be higher, 1.6, 1.7, something like that. Has so anybody got any questions on malts or hops? Like I said, we'll, we'll go over more of the process once we just kind of explain what's going in there. Uh, I know we're kind of jumping into the process as well, but it's yeah. kind of hard not to. Uh, water. Can't make beer without water. Have to have water. The, good, the best rule of thumb on a beginning home brewing is if your water tastes good, more than likely your beer is going to taste good. You're not going to want to get... Uh, you can use tap water. Uh, I prefer not using tap water. I would prefer going and buying all the water you need, uh, like spring water in the gallons at the store, whether it's Walmart, Harps, wherever you want to get it. That's how I started home brewing. It's just a whole lot easier to just, it's already measured out for you. If you don't have a way to measure out gallons of 
water. You just buy a gallon of water and kind of go from there. Um, like I said, I prefer spring water. It puts some of those extra minerals in your water that's actually going to make your beer taste, you know, pretty good. Like I said, it depends on how your process goes. There are some mistakes you can make that's going to, you're like, this doesn't taste good. You know, this doesn't taste like water, but... Uh, my rule of thumb for beginner home brewer is I would just go buy spring water. They're like 89 cents a, a, a gallon. It's very, it's not very inexpensive. But uh, if we uh, decide to do a more advanced class, we can always go over water chemistry and beer salts that you can actually put in your water where you can actually make your water the way you want it. That can actually make a difference in a, a mouthfeel of your beer and things like that. But that's, that's more advanced. We can go over that some other time and if y'all ever have questions say even after this feel free to come ask us about it so, so for something like that would you start with the ionized water then you, you can uh you can also do uh oh, i'm sorry do what i said start with the ionized water and add in whatever you need for it yeah yeah you can and that that comes back to the the more of the water chemistry on making your water how you want it uh you can do that like a lot of people right now they'll do like an ro filter which removes everything out of your water and you just have a place main water it's almost pretty much flavorless you can't really taste anything in it and then um, a lot of people just might buy distilled water if you're going to do water chemistry because it's pretty much the same thing uh, but when i started home brewing uh, i never went and bought distilled water or anything like that i think the first two batches i did was just like right out of faucet in my bathtub you know Stuff like that, making beer, which I didn't know any better. Uh, now that I've kind of learned, if your water tastes good, your beer is more likely going to taste good. So The primary chemical that you're concerned with as a beginning brewer is probably going to be chlorine. Chlorine is not a friend beer. It produces horrible off flavors, so the more chlorine you can get out, the better. And then there's two other primary chemicals that I mess with a lot is uh, gypsum. And uh, actually, chlorine to some extent can add certain depending on the style of beer but like he said that's very uh that's that's more advanced so we probably won't go to that unless you have questions about it yeah they do make uh, certain things like uh, camden tablets that you can put in tap water that is supposed to eliminate most of the chlorine in your uh your water but you can also run water and let it sit out overnight and your chlorine will actually evaporate out of your water doing that too Everybody uh, good, on, good on the water. The thing that I feel like is most important when it comes to brewing. I've brewed many of beers uh, since I've started brewing and I've used uh, many different yeasts. Uh, right now, uh, we actually carry both of these brands of yeast down at the supply side. But uh, so when it comes to yeast, it's really personal preference. Uh, nowadays, they have yeast for every single top style of beer you can think of. They've got just as much yeast as they do hops, it seems like now. Uh, we carry, what, probably 30, 40 different types of yeast, if not more, down That's there right awesome. now. And for everything you can think of, if you want yeast for lager, they have yeast for lager. If you want one, like I said, for a, a Belgian wit, we have it for a Belgian wit. It's really personal preference. The more you brew, the more you'll experiment with different yeasts. I prefer liquid yeast because they've started now doing what is pretty much a yeast starter that comes in a four ounce pack that Imperial uh, uh, produces out of uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, it's literally, you just, I don't know if you've ever heard of like the smack packs where you smack in and release it and you just dump it right into your, your wart and it takes off. Kind of the same process, uh, liquid yeast compared to dry yeast. Now the, this uh, Seyfel, 05 that we have up here, uh, that's what I started brewing with, beginner brewing. It's pretty much your universal yeast. It will uh, ferment out stouts, everything but pretty much a lager. Uh, lagers are a little bit different on the fermentation, but anything else, the USL5, you can pretty much throw it on there and it'll ferment out your beer and it's not going to give you any off flavors or anything like that. Uh, let's see here. Just to go off of the yeast a little bit too, when you're dealing with yeast, you're talking about a microorganism, so these things are alive. And when we're talking about the different types of yeast, you're talking about how the country or the location of origin has evolved these yeasts over time. They've actually bred them to produce certain or to express certain uh, esters, and esters uh, yeah. alcohols, different flavors, different aromas, depending upon the specific style. Because when you really start getting into homebrewing, you can really nerd out on this stuff. I mean, this stuff like a Kolsch, say, 
originated in Cologne, Germany. You're talking about specific water chemistry, you're talking about specific yeast, you're talking about a specific brewing process throughout that entire thing, otherwise they'll, I mean, and in fact, you technically you can't brew a Kolsch unless you are in Cologne, Germany. So, according to the Germans. Quote, quotations. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it, it gets, yeah. exactly, yeah, so it gets pretty technical as you go along. You, of course, you can reproduce that. In fact, we produced a Kolsch at the brewery, and one of the ways that we did that was to actually look up the water report for Cologne, Germany, and try to replicate that as close as possible. And then you buy a yeast that has been um, selected over generations to produce those desired um, characteristics for that specific. Yeah, they, they have a bunch of different strains that you can get from pretty much all over the world that they've kind of, like I said, kind of dated back to certain beer styles. They pretty much got it down. We've got so techno, techno I can't even say the word techno, well, anyways, I don't know. technical on how they can produce the yeast. Sorry, I was getting tongue twisted there. Uh, that they can go back to years and years ago and produce pretty much almost that exact strain. Of course, it's not exact, but they can get pretty close where uh, like I said, certain flavors for a Kolsch, you can have yeast for Kolsch, lagers, anything like that. And this is a modern evolution for sure too. I mean, I would say probably even since the 80s is when they started really putting these out. Before that, it was very difficult to get these types of yeast. They were, they were restricted to certain breweries in certain parts of the world. Or a lot of times in, in like, you know, a thousand years ago, they would only they would use wild yeast. So a lot of times in 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 the original days, the beer that you would produce would almost all be sour. So when you're dealing with wild yeast, you're dealing with a lot of different variables that you don't really know what the beer is coming out as. So when we talk about beer today compared to even 300 years ago, you're talking a dramatic difference. Almost all the beer 300 years ago was smoky because it was smoked above a campfire and it was sour so and probably not super carbonated either so when we talk about this stuff this is something that's really unique to this generation of brewing for sure anybody got any questions on uh, on yeast or everybody pretty much know how yeast works in a beer awesome well that's another thing we could go into is that the yeast you know that's that's how you produce the alcohol so when you go through the mashing process and you produce your sugars and you boil it, and, you're, and when you're boiling it, you're, the primary reason not only to sterilize it, but you're also evaporating certain chemicals within that beer that are undesirable to the finished product, but you're also reducing the volume in order to get a certain amount of sugar to produce a certain amount of alcohol in your beer, and that alcohol is produced when you put the yeast in with what is called the wort, which is beer before it, it has alcohol in it and that yeast will eat those sugars and produce your alcohol. So that's where that comes into play. Might be getting a little ahead or uh, into the weeds in regards to yeast stuff. Go um, for it. But I've looked more into like mead making and I know in that um, yeast nutrient is important because that medium, the must for that doesn't have sufficient nitrogen for yeah. yeast, so you get stalled ferments. Um, is that is there a similar problem to that in beer making, or does wort typically have the nutrients that the yeast would need? Typically the wort is going to have the nutrients that you need for these, because these these types of beer, and, and you know, I'm not super familiar with mead or cider or seltzer, although I brewed seltzer before, but you know, I've run into the same problem. You have to add certain chemicals in it in order to use beer yeast to ferment those products. Now there probably is, there's yeast specifically for mead, right? Yeah. So I don't know, you may, if you bought a yeast that's specific for mead, you may not have to add those chemicals in. Are you, do you know anything about that at all? Uh, always over pitch, <laughs> to do that way. Uh. No, or uh, if it helps, you can always build a starter. And what I mean by build a starter is uh, some of these uh, yeasts, like uh, say Imperial, for example, they have billions of yeast cells per pitch. Uh, we actually had a like a small seminar with them earlier this year, and that was one of the main questions: How do we get from having stuck fermentations? Is it better to over pitch? Is it you know is that going to affect your beer? 
and it's pretty controversial right now between the homebrew and I guess you could say imperial yeast because they instantly said over pitch it's not going to make a difference on your taste but it is going to help you on your outcome but if you've ever tasted anybody's homebrew, uh, I know I have and some of my own, you can actually get a yeasty taste in your beer. So maybe over pitching's not the way to go on it. So. You would have to pitch a lot of yeast to get yeah. that though. And, I, and a lot of these yeast brands that are on the market today don't really lend themselves to that issue at all. So I, don't, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But back to your question, like I, the only way I can relate to that is I brewed a seltzer. So seltzer is a, uh, what I did anyway, was a mixture of sucrose and dextrose, so just regular table sugar and corn sugar together. You boil it for a few minutes to sanitize it, or sterilize it, and then you ferment it, and I use the champagne yeast, but the problem is, is you have to add certain chemicals to activate that yeast in there. It will not consume those, those types of sugar exclusively. You have to add uh, magnesium is one of them. Um, a certain amount of sulfur, a certain amount of calcium. So yeah, you just have to do some Googling around and find out exactly what that mead and what yeast you're using in order to determine exactly what chemicals you need to add in that. But that's a good way to go. And we do that with beer as well, just to produce different expressions and different flavors in the beer. The gypsum that I mentioned, for example, earlier will produce uh, a sharper bitterness and it will express the flavor of the hop a little bit better whereas the chlorine will add mouthfeel and uh, and produce more of a malty flavor in your beer so things like that you can fiddle around with and get different things out of it yeah like a like I said, going off subject on like meads and ciders there uh, and uh, if anybody has questions about this uh, at the end we do have a local homebrew club that has, I've sent a lot of people to that actually we don't just focus on beer it's beer it's if it's fermented we talk about it we usually do presentations there as well but if anybody's interested y'all can get a hold of me after class and i can give y'all all the info but on things like that if you're in if, say if you're here and you're learning about beer but you've been interested in making wines or ciders or meads or anything like that just get with me or matt after after class and we can give out some more uh, details on like other groups that y'all can get with and that talk about everything besides just beer so yeah or anytime just swing by the brewery yeah. we're perfectly happy to help anybody with any issues that you got but uh going on basic equipment now you want me to take over this one sure <laughs> i'm going to step over here so uh like we were saying just years ago uh if you were going to make beer up until, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, it seems like you would have to have three vessels. You'd have to have what they call a hot liquor tank, uh, which actually has nothing to do with liquor. Why they call it a hot liquor tank, I'm not sure, but all it does is keep warm water in a tank for you. And then you would have, let me move this out of the way. So what, like a, a hot liquor tank would literally be a pot just like this, wouldn't have your ports on it. It was literally just to hold warm water. Uh, then you would go over and you would have what you would call a mash tun. Now a mash tun, I know Matt elaborated on that a little bit earlier about having a pot just like this, but it has a false bottom. So it almost like had a screen in the bottom of it. And that's how you would filter all of your wort out of your grains. And that's why I kind of brought one like this to where, you know, you'd filter it through and this is how you would get all your warts out or get all your wort out and still keep your grains in. Uh, but some people, they've come in, they've asked me like, why do you have two holes drilled in the side of a pot? and one's for a thermometer and one's for just a ball lock. It makes it a little bit easier come brew day because when I first started brewing, I would literally get like a turkey thermometer and stick it in my, just to see where my temperature was to hold it. And when you have this, it makes it a whole lot easier. Um, but this would be, like I said, all three vessels would almost look the same. The first two would for sure. Uh, you would have your hot liquor tank, a mash tun, and then you would have a boil kettle, which you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a hot liquor tank and a boil kettle. Uh, and how I set mine up, and I'm going to make this look kind of funny up here, but when I first started home brewing, I would have my three vessels. I'd have my hot liquor tank. So I'd have my hot liquor tank like sitting up higher like this, and I would like tear step it down and let gravity do all the work. So I would have my hot water in my hot liquor tank here. I would have a hose coming off here into a secondary uh, pot, which would be my mash tun. And I'd have all my grains in my mash tun. And what I would do, I'd run that warm water off into my grains and I would let it sit. 
in there for 60 minutes or however many minutes you, you know, it says on your recipe. Most of the recipes on kits that we sell have step-by-step -step instructions on how long you should mesh in. So you would leave your, your malts in your water for however long process you wanted to, and then they would go from that down to your boil kettle, which I had mine sitting on like a turkey burner. So it'd have three different vessels just tear stepping down. And uh, they all have three different purposes. You would have what you would keep your hot water in for your hot liquor tank. You would have your mash tun that you'd keep your grains in. And then you'd have your boil kettle down at the bottom. And literally, it would, like I said, it would just come out of your hot water. It would rinse all your sugars off your grains. All that sugar off your grains would go into your boil uh, kettle. So whenever you got done, you'd be ready to go to boil. Nowadays, uh, to eliminate uh, two of those vessels, somebody said, why don't you just throw a bag in there? So what this does, you can put your water in there for your, say your hot liquor tank. This could be your hot liquor tank now. And say you want your water at 152 degrees. We're just throwing a number out there. Uh, you can warm this up to 152 degrees, throw this bag in there. Now you've got a mash tun. You literally can just throw your grains in there, let it mash in for whatever temperature you want. When you're done, pull this. A lot of people, I've realized if you're going to use a pot like this, uh, an oven rack. You can grab an oven rack and set it on top of it, and then you can literally just sit your grains and let them drain out on top of that. Got a mash tun. Now, like a giant tea bag. Yeah, exactly. a giant tea bag. <laughs> now, now I've got a boil kettle. It's just, it's super simple. You wouldn't think that just a little giant tea bag would eliminate two vessels for you, but it does. And if you, say you live in an apartment or you don't have a big area to brew at, this is a lifesaver from having to have three different vessels to brew in. You can just have one vessel sit on top of your stove if you wanted, and all you would need is a big giant tea bag. So that's definitely helped out, pretty much changed uh, the way, not changed the way you brew, but changed up the space and the amount of space you would need to brew. Uh, Let's see here. Well, actually, I can see it up here. Uh, going on from there, which I think I covered most of that, except for the wart chiller, but that's a little bit to come. Uh, I would just say real quick before we move on, the temperature at which you mash your grains at as a beginning home brewer is something that you want to consider as well. Yes. You're talking about a temperature range between, say, what, like 132 and 100. And, 58 Eight, yeah yeah and you're going to get uh it's different uh, so depending on what temperature you mash at you're going to activate what they call different amylases in in the mash you got an a, a alpha amylase and a beta amylase the alpha amylase will produce small chain sugars which are easily fermentable they will uh, ferment out very quickly. You'll get a very active fermentation and you'll be left with a product that would be something that you would use for a lighter beer. It will have less mouthfeel. Whereas if you mash at a higher temperature around 100, like I like 156 is usually what I do a stout or a porter at, you'll get a much thicker mouthfeel, but you'll also have an issue with your fermentation process. Whereas it will not produce as much alcohol as the same amount of small chain sugar will in a different beer. So that's something that you want to consider when you're doing your mashes. Just to elaborate on that a little bit. Yes. So if you're doing a mash tun in a pot like that, you just got a small flame at the bottom to maintain that temperature? That yeah, you'll have to adjust it. Like a, it's definitely difficult, say on say a conventional uh, uh, oven, like in your house or stove in your house, I mean. Uh, it's kind of hard to regulate that temperature. Uh, but like on a, say, a, a turkey burner or a, a live flame, it's a little bit easier because you can adjust the heat on that more than you can on, uh, say, an electric, at least to, to mine. I mean, you can, but it's kind of just hit or miss on both of them. There's... So, uh, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Sorry. So I had, I've got like a big cooler mm -hmm. that I made into a mash tun. Yeah. And I get my water to whatever I'm about, maybe a little hotter, put it in. Yep. I'm wondering if that is... I'm losing temperature. You, know, you do from your transfer from your water, the, the, your warm water that you're putting in from, like, say, your hot liquor tank or wherever you're getting it. Uh, depending on how many grains you have in your mash tun, there is a it will decrease the temperature of your water as you go. It, but it also depends on how many grains you have. Like, I think we set our equipment. I know if I want to be like, say, mashing in right at 152, I usually set uh, the water in our hot liquor tank for like 178 degrees. 
Typically, uh, you're looking at a temperature decrease of somewhere around 8 to 10 degrees, yeah. depending on how much grain. All it is is a heat transfer, so your grain is sitting at whatever room temperature is, and you're adding your hot water in there, so it's going to cool that water off just by the, the properties that the grain inter, introduced into that water will yeah. have, if that makes sense. So if you're wanting to like mash in at 150 degrees, you want to have your water higher than 150 About degrees? About 160, yeah. I would say, would be a safe bet. And then... Um, you probably could. You could probably yeah. stick it in the oven, but then you might end up with some kind of issue where some of the the sugar might break down right. because you're heating it up at a too high of a temperature. I've never tried that. You possibly could, but it's just it's common practice just to mash in at a higher temperature, higher temperature than yeah. exactly what you want to maintain throughout that entire hour during the mashing. And if you lose a degree or two, I mean. Obviously, if you're going for reproducibility, you want to keep that as close as you can, but a degree or two for a homebrew process is not going to make a huge noticeable Yeah, it difference. won't make or break your beer. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally wouldn't try to warm my grains because you have the chance of scorching them or give, putting some type of off flavors in your beer as well. Yeah, so. I'd say that too. Okay, and as far as the uh, asking about putting heat underneath your mash tun too, I don't know. If I would do that either, I don't know if anybody does that. Do you, I never did. There okay. is a process called vorlofting, too, that you can do, um, which is where you will pull the wort out of the bottom while you're mashing, run it back through your hot liquor tank to heat it back up, and then put it back on top of the grain bed and allow Then that will keep your temperature very consistent yeah. as long as your equipment is good. Uh, that's more advanced equipment too. It is, yeah. It is. I'm getting a little. No, mad. no, you're good. You're good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like nowadays they have so much different, uh, say electric, uh, brewing kits out there. Uh, like uh, I'd like I brewed like he said right out of a two igloo coolers. That was my hot liquor tank and my mash tun, and I just had a stainless steel pot for my boil kettle, and I did that for years. And those igloo coolers will hold that heat yeah, surprisingly well. Surprisingly, well. they will. Yeah. Holds the heat pretty well. Uh, now they have all electric brewing systems to where you literally can get it in, do a small assembly, plug it into a wall, and it's like, set it and forget it. You know, put it to whatever temperature you want. You can literally just walk away and it won't go over that temperature. Make it a little bit easier for you. And they have them now where you can have literally just one vessel that has a heating element in there. And instead of having uh, a bag like this, some of them come with like a stainless steel mesh that you can literally pull out and they have like little hooks on them where you can just turn it and it sits right there and drinks right into your pot. But, yeah, they've done a lot of advancements on uh, all your ingredients you'd put in the beer on top of the equipment that you're gonna use to make beer as well. It just depends on how much money you wanna spend, which yeah. if you get, this is a very addictive hobby, you'll end up, I mean, I started out building all my equipment and I think I was like five grand deep by the time I was done. So just be aware that you might yeah. end up it, it, is, yeah. it, is. it is. It is. At the beginning, it's an expensive hobby, uh, but once you've got your equipment that you want and that you like, then it's actually pretty inexpensive compared to some of the prices of, you know, craft beer these days. Uh, I do have a shirt that I almost wore today that says "Death Before Eighteen Dollar Four Packs," and it's like kind of getting <laughs> ridiculous on prices. It seems like nowadays, so a lot of people have went to home brewing because it's cheaper. I mean, if you do an all grain uh, five gallon batch. Most of our kits range between twenty and thirty dollars for five gallons of beer. When now you can maybe get two six packs for like thirty dollars at the store. So it is definitely cheaper once you get your equipment. But the startup process it can be as expensive as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Like like Matt said, like you can get. I think with the, all the extras on here, like the ball lock, the temperature, the pot, and everything. I think we sell these for like a hundred twenty, hundred twenty five bucks for that. But that's all you need. When it comes, you don't need three vessels anymore. And then our buckets are like 20 bucks for your fermentation vessels and like a dollar 25 for an airlock. So for 200 bucks, you could get a whole kit and everything you need starting off. And then after that, you're running 20, 30 bucks, depending on how big a beer you want to make, how, how high you want an ABV, uh, things like that. But I, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Uh, there's differences between all grain and partial mash and stuff like that that we'll get to. Uh, and, and the process changed there as well. 
Uh, let's see here, we talked about our three vessels that we've actually consoled consoled down to one vessel now. Uh, we put wart chiller on there. Uh, as you can also see in parentheses, we put you can coal in a bathtub or a sink as well. So what you're trying to do in your process of uh, making your beer, you kind of want to cool your wart down as quickly as possible because anything that touches your wart pre-boil, you really don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about bacteria or anything because you're going to boil it, it's going to kill anything. But as soon as you're done with that boil and you start cooling it off, that's when you have to worry about sanitation, have my hands clean, did my hands touch the beer, did the whatever I put my wart or whatever into, was it clean, was it sanitized, that's when you have to start worrying about stuff. So that's where the wart chiller comes in. The wart chiller, uh, I wish we would have had one down in supply, but I think we, well, we sold our last one. Uh, but it literally looks like a stainless steel coil, that it, it, literally just a coil that's about yay long, about 25 foot long, and what you can do, you, it, has, it comes up, it's got the coil, you set it in there and it has like two little hooks that hook over the side of your pot. One side you hook a, just a standard water hose up to from like off the side of your house, and the other one just has a drainage hose on it. And what it does, it cools your wart from boiling down to say, 70 whatever degree, 70 between 67 and 72 however cold your water is extremely quick compared to like putting it in a bathtub of ice or a sink full of ice which if you don't have ways to get a wart chiller or say you're trying to save up money to get one that perfectly works too i did that for years as well i'd go buy a couple of bags of ice run cold water in my bathtub and literally just grab my pot and sit it right inside my bathtub now of course it took about three or four hours for it to get down to temperature uh, where I could pitch my yeast, but now with the wart chiller, you can literally do it in like 20, 30 minutes, depending on how cold your water gets. Uh, like I said, that is an optional thing. That's something that you don't have to have to make beer, but we did want to put it up there just so you guys knew that there is things out there that can cool your wart off quicker. And you're cooling your wart down because your yeast has a lower tolerance to temperature, yeah. basically. So you're trying to make sure that that yeast is not pitched into something that it can't deal with and it'll just kill it immediately if it's too yeah. high or if it's too low, the yeast won't come out of dormancy and won't ferment your beer. Yeah, now uh, they have recently made some yeast uh, that if y'all are familiar with any beer or beer recipes, it's actually called, this is also controversial, it's either Kvek or Kvak yeast. Uh, it's actually a Norwegian strain that you can actually throw it into your ward at 100 degrees and it thrives. It, it'll ferment out a five gallon batch of beer in like, 48, 72 hours. Which is very unusual. Yeah. Typically any other strain of yeast won't tolerate anything above 80. 80, yeah. yeah. I think this one right here is like 72, 76 degrees. If you throw it over there, it might not even ferment. Uh, with yeast and temperature, um, I know uh, people use dry yeasts as well and rehydrate them. Sure. You typically mm -hmm. rehydrate them at a higher temperature than you're gonna be having the work at. Um, can that thermal shock kill you the yeast? Uh, it really depends on your temperature. I've never heard of that before either. Rehydrating at a higher temperature. Have yeah, you heard I, about I that? haven't heard that. I typically, when I'm doing a starter, which is basically what you're talking about, rehydrating the yeast to some extent anyway, I will um, try to mimic the temperature that the beer that it's going to go into. That way I don't have any shock. There may be an issue there. I'm not, I'm, I've never heard of that process myself. So I would just stick, like even when we're brewing at the brewery, I will do my mash and when I'm transferring it to the boil kettle, I will take some of that pre-boil wort and I will cool it off and I will add it into my starter just so that yeast will be familiar with exactly what it's gonna be dealing with when I pitch it into the fermenter. And that may be excessive, I don't know, but I think I, I, I get really good fermentation well, so through that. Good. Yeah, so. That, that would be my advice, is just try to mimic the beer that you're going into as much as possible. I think they're passing out one of those uh, yeast packets right now. I'll definitely take a look at it. I think that exact brand is actually out of Austria that we get in, uh, but it's, it's for a specific type of beer, which would be a Belgian wit. Doesn't mean you have to make a Belgian wit to put it in. You can put that in whatever you want, but it, it's just one that it says on there. Uh, Going over to the next thing you would need in your process, you've got your wart that you've made, you've got all of your equipment, you're going to need something for it to ferment in. Uh, I used plastic buckets for years and years until I could afford literally a stainless steel one. Uh, like I said, these run about, with the lid and airlock and everything, you're looking at like 25 bucks. You know, you can 
you can get them cheaper at certain places. Uh, but basically, you got a, about a six and a half gallon bucket there, like uh, Matt said earlier. Over here, you've got, you know, you're going to want to fill it to five gallons, but you're going to need that head space for your fermentation. Uh, but it's literally, I mean, it's just a, a plastic bucket. We do have spigots. This is why the hole is drilled in the side. It is for a spigot. Uh, I tell a lot of people, and apparently I might be a terrible businessman running a supply side, but I feel like you only need one bucket for fermentation. Some people prefer two, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, what I do, when I usually brew my beers, and I put them in a bucket when I used to, I realize that I can put that spigot on the bottom of it, and I can ferment in this. When you ferment your wort, most of the stuff, uh, the yeast and everything will actually fall to the bottom uh, during the fermentation process. You'll have what they call like trub or trub at the bottom, and it's like a big old like yeast cake and just looks like gunky nastiness on the bottom of it. A lot of people like to get uh, a secondary bucket uh, and transfer from that bucket over to what we call a bottling bucket. This is actually a bottling bucket because it has the, the drilled port for a spigot to bottle. Uh, like I said, I just kind of skipped over having the one without the hole because you can literally bottle off of this. The reason people get two is for more clarity. They want to pull off the beer and not get all that stuff off the bottom. Uh, I've never really had that problem. And most of the time, whenever you go from your fermentations done and you go to bottling, it'll settle at the bottom of your bottle anyways. Just whenever you get done uh, bottle conditioning your beer, just don't go shaking up your bottle and open it. Nobody does that anyways. <laughs> and it'll actually, you know, anything that might have come out of that fermentation is going to stay at the bottom of your bottle because you're going to, when you store them. So, uh, you like also you also run a risk of infecting your beer by transferring it from one vessel yeah. to another. It's a very controversial topic. A lot of people say you need to do a secondary fermentation vessel, but I never did either. I don't think yeah. it's totally necessary. Most of your tube is going to settle out into the bottom of the bucket. You're going to have a clear product at the end if you brewed it correctly. There's You run more of a risk of infecting your beer by transferring it to another vessel than yep. you do in the benefits that you would get out of doing that, in my opinion, anyway. And then they, you can kind of see where they drill the hole. They don't have it all the way at the bottom. Uh, I don't know if they did that on purpose. I never realized if they did or not because most of the time you're not going to have three or four inches of trube in a five-gallon batch. I mean, that's a, that's a lot. Uh, most of it will stay below that spigot hole, so you actually won't be pouring out a lot of the junk or trube into your beer, or into your bottles, I mean. But, uh, so, people, another controversy, plastic versus stainless steel. Uh, or glass. Or glass. Uh, I definitely uh, would suggest, unless you're going to be making something that you want to see the fermentation process, like wines or meads, I would definitely stay away from glass, and the reason is, it's dangerous. Uh, you, one little slip and you've got a big old giant glass jug hitting the ground and shattering into a thousand pieces. Uh, easily cut yourself. Uh, you drop a plastic bucket, the worst thing that's going to happen is it's going to fall over and dump out. You're not going to break anything. Uh, but yeah, I, you, I've never really used a lot of glass for fermenting beer in. Now, I've made a couple of batches of wine that I like to put in a glass carboy, uh, but that's usually on the final fermentation process when it gets hit. Uh, but there are, there are different options out there. We had a gentleman come in just yesterday with a look like an old water jug, and he was using it for a fermentation vessel. Uh, it all just comes down to sanitization, and you can use pretty much whatever you want. Sanitization and keeping oxygen out of yeah. your beer. Oxygen's a big factor when you're ferment, fermenting your beer. You don't want any oxygen getting into your beer. Uh, it produces a lot of terrible off flavors and it can also damage the yeast itself actually when yep. you're fermenting so it's your worst enemy it is and then going back to glass another problem that you could run into that is light infiltration light light will produce a skunky flavor in your beer like Heineken or Rolling Rock that's why they have green bottles because they desire that flavor so it allows in a certain spectrum of light into their bottles so you run the same risk when you're doing a, a glass yeah. carboy or something like that to ferment in and I've, I've always heard it, uh, heard it called light struck when your beer gets light struck it's that skunkiness uh, I, I don't know if that's the correct term I'm not sure what you call it either <laughs> that's how I've, uh, I've had people have always said it to me your beer got light struck so it's got a skunkiness to it yeah uh, airlock one of the simplest designs ever if I don't break it trying to get it out uh, once you've got your wart transferred over to your fermenter uh, literally 
this is pretty much what's going to keep the oxygen out of your beer. Now, people are like, well, once you put it in there and you close the lid, there's going to be oxygen in there. Yes, there is. But once your beer starts fermenting, it's going to push all that oxygen out of your uh, fermenter, whether it's a bucket or whatever, and it's going to eliminate all the oxygen in there. And then that's where your airlock comes in. It prevents oxygen from going back into your bucket or into your fermenter. Uh, what I usually do, some people will fill it up with a, a, a spirit if they want, vodka, whatever. I usually just put sanitizer in there because um, everything that touches my wart post-boil is sanitized. This gets sanitized, the bucket gets sanitized. I'll even pour, pull this little grommet out. I'll sanitize it. Uh, just one thing, if you've never brewed beer and you're going to want to try to brew some beer, sanitization. I can't say it enough. Sanitize everything. Like I said, it's kind of confusing because before anything gets boiled, you really don't have to worry about it. Of course, I'm not going to want to like dump a bunch of grains on the ground and scoop them up, mill them, and boil them. But I mean, you probably could. Yeah, you could. Probably wouldn't tell the difference. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> but you get a little bit of dog flavor. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, in your totally. Beer. But you won't get infected. And in fact, you know, there, even during primary fermentation you don't run a super risk of infection in my opinion anyway because the yeast are active and they're going to consume a lot of the bacteria that's in there now some of those bacteria if they become overwhelming will overwhelm the yeast so you, you got to be a little bit more careful when you're fermenting you're on your primary fermentation but it's not as critical as when you are doing your conditioning process or your bottling or anything like that but like he said, sanitize, sanitize all the time. All, I mean, just air on the side of... I think we did have a question over oh, here. okay, sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. Topic, if you have a problem with contamination, is it pretty evident before you might consume it? It is. Uh, you'll pretty much know uh, when you pop the top of the, your fermenter. Uh, sometimes you'll see like a white lacing on top. It's not always bad, but you'll be able to tell by looking at it. If there's mold growing in it, yeah, there's something went wrong, and usually by smell as well you can tell that it's off uh have we drank have i drank infected beer before yeah didn't get sick off of it but it doesn't taste good <laughs> it, typically you're gonna just have like weird off flavors and sour is a is a real common when you get infected your beer will turn yeah. sour but like he said it's not gonna kill you, you no not at all yeah. but uh like i said on the airlocks i usually just fill it up there's a little line mark here i don't know if y'all can see them but you only fill them up halfway uh and like I said, I like to put sanitizer in mine. Uh, you can put spirits, whatever you want in there. Just something that's going to keep any bacteria from kind of growing in there, and it's going to keep your oxygen from going back into your bucket. Uh, you can ferment beer without a lid, without an airlock, if you want to make certain solid beers. There's actually, uh, if you want to use, uh, what well, was just called open top fermenting. Uh, we actually, Matt does that with his uh, Hefeweizen that he does, his uh, German wheat beer. He'll do a primary fermentation, and then right when it gets up to what, high krausen pretty much? Yeah, I'll let it go for a day or so just to make sure that it doesn't make a mess by bubbling out of the top of the fermenter, and then I'll take the lid off the fermenter because in the case of that specific beer in combination with that specific yeast strain, the oxygen is actually beneficial in producing the banana and the clove uh, aromas that are typical of that beer, but uh, unless you're producing a certain specific style of beer, you want to be careful about that oxygen yeah. getting in there. So. And in case somebody had a question about that, about do you have to have a lid on your fermenter? You don't, but it helps. You know, it's kind of like running a marathon without shoes. You don't have to have shoes, but they help. A lot of places, you know, traditionally they would brew open fermentation. You know, a couple hundred years ago, they didn't have all the ability to do this kind of stuff. So that's where we get into the sours and off flavors you know a lot of traditional saisons and farmhouse style ales will, were all open fermentation for yeah. the most part so those are good examples of the off flavors that you'll get if you allow oxygen into your beer as well as environmental contaminants you know you got everything from spiders dropping into your beer to foreign <laughs> bacteria and stuff right. like that but you know somebody walks by and Sneezes yeah, on it, you you'll know. get that. You never know. Some people are crazy, though. Some people like that style and that flavor. So, so uh, auto siphon uh, we've got up there for another uh, basic equipment. That's also a not a necessity, but we wanted to put it up there to let y'all know. It just m makes it a little bit easier. Uh, I actually I thought I grabbed one, but I guess I didn't. 
Uh, we do have auto softens down at, at the supply side at the brewery, but all it is, it looks like a, just a, a wand that kind of goes down into your fermentator or fermentation bucket. Uh, and it also has like little hooks that you can hook it on the side. And it, it's just like a little cane inside of a plastic tube where you pump it. And it's just a, what it says is auto soften. It'll actually pump your wart out and then you can go into your bottles, you can go to your kegs, whatever you want. Uh, like I said, it's not ne necessary. That's why they have these buckets that you can put a spigot on and you can literally hook up a tube of this over to a bottling wand and you can bottle right out of that. You don't even have to have a, a siphon. But it's just an option if you want one. It's, it all really comes down to clarity. If you're trying to get as clear beer as you can get, uh, you can get an auto siphon. You can transfer it from one bucket to another one. But like Matt said, you have that option of introducing bacteria you don't want uh, into your beer because the more you transfer it around, the more oxygen you can get to it and the more bacteria you can get to it. I use an auto siphon in my early days of brewing and they're very helpful. I mean, if you don't have pumps or if you don't have a, a nozzle on the side of your bucket, it's just an easy way to transfer yeah. from one vessel to another. So if you ended up with a bucket, like a lot of the buckets, like if, if you went and say bought one at Lowe's, you're either going to have to drill a hole in the side of it and, because the, most of them don't have holes drilled in the side and it needs a bucket with a hole in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, that's where the auto siphon would come in. If you bought a bucket like that, you can siphon right out of those and that doesn't have the port on the side of it. And it's better than just sucking on your tube. You get a <laughs> right. siphon going. You're going to get a lot of bacteria that way. And then uh, the last piece of equipment for uh, making your beer, you're either going to bottle or keg. 99% of beginners are going to bottle their beer. It's a pain in the butt. I'm <laughs> not going to lie. It is terribly painful to, or to bottle beer. Uh, but it is fun. The reward is, is it's worth it. Uh, I bottled beer forever, but you, I mean, there's not really anything else you can do unless you go to kegging beer. Uh, but bottling, uh, bottles and kegs are your two options. Uh, as, uh, anybody pretty much know the process of how you're going to get your beer into your bottle and the, the getting it carved up. It's really, really simple. Say you're coming out of your fermenter, every, all your, it's now beer. It was wort, it's beer because it's been fermented. Uh, you're going to have, like I said, a, a spigot on here, and you can have a piece of tubing, which we all have it at the, at the brew supply. And one thing that's called a bottling wand. It looks like a, literally looks like a straw, and it has a little bitty plastic tip on the bottom of it that has a spring in there, so it's spring-loaded. And what you do, you'll open up your valve to your uh, fermentation bucket, to that bottling wand and it'll hold the beer in that wand but as soon as you put that wand and touch the bottom of a bottle it'll start filling it it'll relieve that valve and what you'll do you, you'll fill each bottle all the way up to the top uh, a lot of people uh, don't realize but and i don't know if they did it on purpose but those wands they have a specific or they take up a specific volume in the bottle so whenever you fill it all the way to the top whenever you pull that wand out you have your perfect pour in your bottle it's about halfway up the neck of your bottle uh, but you'll go through that, but five gallons of beer, you're looking at, what is it, 40 something bottles of beer, I think out of five gallons, or is it I'd a have to more? calculate it out. It's 128 ounces per gallon, gallon. times five, and then your yeah. bottles are typically 12 ounces a piece. You're, you're gonna so. need about 30 to 40 bottles. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it's just time consuming. And there's nothing wrong with it. I used to love bottling beer, but it's super time consuming if you're in a rush on a, on a brew day bottling just like I said it's time consuming it's kind of a pain in the butt and along with that uh, there's two different ways to carve your beer I know this is kind of going off of equipment but it's on the same process uh, you can either put priming sugar what they call priming sugar into your beer which is literally just sugar and water or you can use honey uh, but, but when it comes down to whatever sugar you want to use honey table sugar whatever uh, we have calculations of course uh, on the, the recipes that you'll just warm it up and then you'll actually pour it directly into your bottling bucket or your fermenter. Uh, I like doing it, but I also don't like doing it because once again, if you're putting sugars into your beer and stirring, you can cause oxidization or getting oxygen into your beer. I don't like to do it. Uh, we also sell things like, they're called just carb, uh, carb drops. They look like a little piece of candy. It's just a little piece of sugar that you can put in each one of your bottles. That way you don't have to worry about getting any oxygen introduced into it. You just put one of those in each one of your bottles and just fill up your bottle uh, with beer, cap it, and you're good to go. But that's how you out get your carbonation to your beer. There's still some live yeast in that, in that beer. So you, know, you introduce sugars back to yeast, what's it start doing again? It starts 
uh, fermenting. Fermenting out, uh, not enough to tell the difference. But when it's fermenting, it's still releasing a little bit of alcohol, but it's also releasing carbon dioxide. And so that's how it's carving your beer inside the bottle. It's called bottle conditioning. It's a very uh, tricky process. If, if, I, if there was one reason why people quit home brewing, that's probably it. Yeah. It's very inconsistent. It's very hard to carbonate in a bottle like that. Sometimes it'll be super carbonated and it'll you open the bottle and it'll blow up to the ceiling. Sometimes yeah. you'll open the bottle and it'll be flat. You won't even hear a psh, yeah. it'll just nothing. It's very tricky. That's why when I was home brewing, I switched to keg conditioning really quickly. Like probably within the first two months I was in the kegs and it's way easier. So when you're doing that, you're basically just transferring all of your beer out of your fermenting vessel into a keg and then you'll have a CO2 tank that you'll hook up to that keg and you'll continuously pump CO2 into that keg in order to carbonate it to a certain level that you want it to be, which is something that is particular to style as well. So, But it's a lot easier process, it's a lot easier to control. You know your beer is carbonated before you waste a whole bunch or, you know, you bottle two cases of beer, you set it into your closet for a week or two, and then you pull it out. It's very disappointing when it's flat or if you're only getting half the beer because the other half's on the floor or right. something like that. You, so. you hear it in the middle and out, boom, 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 just yeah. bottle yeah. bombs oh, yeah. is what we call them. Yeah, you they can walk in blow up a huge <laughs> mess, absolutely. Also, I thought at one time I thought it'd be smart that I was going to go ahead and uh, bottle condition in a growler. You know how you can go get the growlers and fill it up full of beer? Don't do that. <laughs> There's different thicknesses of actual glass, uh, I found out, that if it does build up pressure inside those, those will break really, really fast. Uh, and believe it or not, there's different types of bottles uh, for just uh, conditioning your beer, carving your beer in a bottle. Uh, if you get them from, and this is not just a plug for the supply side, the homebrew beer bottles that we carry are actually higher rated than other bottles that you can get like from different different stores. You want to get the ones that are specific for home brewing. They actually have a higher tolerance on pressure. I, I didn't realize that until about two years ago. I thought so, a bottle was a bottle. So don't reuse all those beer bottles. Like no, I'm not saying that because, uh, but uh, there's just different ratings. The ones I get from my supplier are higher rated than normal ones because all the bottles that you're drinking from the store, those weren't carved in the bottle. They were pre-carved in a fermenter or in a keg and then put in the bottle. So they're not building pressure. But people use them all the time. Uh, I, I did that too. I'd go get the, the green Grolsch bottles that have the flip top uh, because they were just, uh, I didn't want to have to buy yeah. beer bottle caps all the time in a capper. So those you could just pop off and pop back on and reuse them all you want. But there goes the chance of your beer getting skunky flavor because it's a green bottle. Now, I'm pretty sure we discussed the brewing process as we were discussing everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, here's a quick just uh, pictograph of pretty much the brewing process, except it looks like they got, uh, they got bottles and kegs up there and all kinds of things. So has anybody, uh, going back to equipment a little bit, has anybody ever heard of a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm trying to think of it. It's a keg that somebody has transferred into uh, a, a brewing vessel. Uh, I think it's called a, ke a kegel, something like that. Uh, but yeah, you can actually get like old kegs and literally cut the top out of them and turn them into a brewing vessel. I mean, you, you can use just about it, anything you want. And that, that's what that kind of reminded me of. They're actually, looks like Stephen Grains in a mash tun that looks like a keg. You can use them for mash tuns, you can use them as boil kettles, pretty much anything. Uh, One thing we didn't talk about, and I, and I kind of probably misled you a little bit by saying that oxygen is not good for beer, but actually, oh, yeah. once you are getting ready to ferment, you want to inject oxygen into that as much as possible because that allows the yeast to become active and it, it, it's beneficial at the start of fermentation. Once fermentation is complete, you don't want any oxygen yeah. in well, Another one of those trick things that I had to learn the hard way too. Yeah. You know, I thought, oh, I, it's okay. I can s stir this up, put my, my sugars in there for bottle conditioning. No, it's not, it's not good for it. A common off flavor for 
oxygen contamination is wet cardboard. So yeah. you, you definitely want to really avoid that. Good. Yeah. Uh, they also have a secondary fermentation on here. We kind of, we didn't skip over, but we kind of did. The, a lot of the times that I ever did a second fermentation uh, was when I was doing like a, a fruit type of beer, or if I'm gonna add some type of fruits to my beer. I would have my primary fermenter with my beer that was fermenting in it. And once my beer was completely fermented out, and this is another thing that I learned the hard way, I thought, well, heck, I could just throw my wort and my yeast all on top of my fruits and go. Unless you pasteurize your fruits or anything like that, you could get bacteria off your fruits and things like that. So I found out a bunch of, you know, a couple of times the hard way, why does this not taste like blueberries? Why does this not taste like strawberries? Why does it taste sour? You know, or, uh, but on a secondary fermentation, that's what I usually did. I would ferment out my primary beer until it was done. No more fermenting. Uh, and then I would actually pasteurize or freeze my fruits or whatever I wanted to do to make sure there was no bacteria on them, thaw them out, and then I would put them actually in a, a straining bag kind of like this size so I could pull it out whenever I wanted. And I would rack my beer up on, on top of whatever fruits that I wanted, and then I would let that sit in the secondary fermentation. Sometimes it would kick back off from the sugars in the fruit, sometimes it wouldn't. You would just get your flavors of it. But that's, that's mainly the only time I do a secondary fermentation is if I'm gonna do like fruits or anything like that. And you can use something like vodka. I use vodka a lot to sterilize anything that yeah. you're going to put into your secondary firm just to make sure that you don't get that infection problem. And also this uh, where it says age four to six weeks, that's also subjective. Uh, what I would do, I would definitely wait at least two weeks on most beers to let it, you know, carve up and like finish out. Uh, but if you're, I mean, if you're thirsty and you want to drink beer, you got a party that you're going to be doing or something, and you want your beer ready, uh, it's nothing saying that you can't pop it after two weeks, three weeks. But there's that chance of it not being super carb or anything like that. Uh, basic rule of thumb is the longer a beer sets, the more it ages out, and actually the better flavors you get off of it. Uh, I'm very, very bad about pushing beers, uh, homebrew and commercial. That probably would be okay if I let them set a couple more weeks, but. I'm in such a hurry, like, oh, this is going to be good. You know, we got to get this out and let people try it. I've, I've had a couple beers that, you know, two weeks after we released it, it tasted better than it did two weeks before. And that's true for certain styles, for sure. An IPA, you probably don't want to age that out very much. You want that fresh hop yep. to come out, pop. Uh, whereas, you know, a stout, you want to age out maybe for maybe even four to six months sometimes. Like I was talking to you guys before we started, something like a Marzen, which you brew in March, is supposed to lager for six months. So, you know, it just depends on the style of beer that you're going for. But typically, I'm a proponent of aging as long as possible. I think it improves the quality of everything except an IPA greatly. Yeah. So. Also, not to discourage anybody that loves lagers, if you're going to be a, a new home brewer or anything, <coughs> Uh, and brew a beer and you want your first beer to be a lager, I would suggest trying something different than a lager your first time because there is a extra steps in a lager that you would need on brewing than you would say a blonde ale or an IPA or anything like that. Uh, lagers, like Matt was just saying, you can age them out for months. Actually, it's called the lagering process. You put it in a colder temperature or slightly put cold temperature to it and decrease it until you get down to whatever degrees you want. But uh, if you're wanting to make a lager, get ready to wait. You know, you won't, it won't be ready in a month. It won't be ready in two months. You know, the first one I did was probably two years into brewing and I hated to open up my fridge and seeing that beer sitting in there and I open it up the next month, like I could still can and still, you know, and whenever I'd open that, the door to that fridge, I would watch that airlock and it would actually start taking off fermenting again. So, I mean, it was, it was still fermenting. It's just a super slow fermentation, so. Yeah, and when and a lager is difficult also, you're going to need extra equipment in order to maintain that temperature as yeah. well. It, it ferments at less than two to, uh, room temperature, typically. Now, there's certain yeast strains that you can get that will produce a faux lager, and uh, it's, I've used them. They work pretty well. I mean, what did I do? Um, I did a lime lager yeah. with, a, with a faux yeast and it turned out perfectly fine. So that's another technological advance that you can take advantage of. Otherwise, you're going to need 
like he said, a refrigerator to put it in with a temperature control on it or something yeah. like that. So it's a difficult, it's probably the most difficult style of beer to brew. Yeah, like I said, I learned a lot of things the hard way when I was beginner brewer, uh, beginning in brewing and home brewing. Like, I, I, you know, most people would drink uh, Pilsners or lagers. That's pretty much what you had available to you before the craft beer revolution happened. And that's like what everybody wants to go to. Let's do a Pilsner or let's do a, a lager. And it's just time consuming on the process of fermentation or making it. That's the only reason I would steer away from it being your first beer. Uh, I think one of my first beers I made was a, a Blonde Ale. And it was literally done in about two and a half weeks. Uh, I could have probably pushed it a little bit quicker or just cracked it open. But that's also another one that I tried it a month later and it tastes totally different. It was super mellow and had more esters and aromas to it than it did, you know, three weeks of from grain to glass so just keep that in mind too i know sometimes I'm, for me it's hard for me to wait once i make one i'm like got the clock set i'm ready to crack one open and you know try it so just keep that in mind on certain beer styles that y'all want to you know learn to make research your beer that's you know that's what i did when you i mean you got google you got the internet it's an amazing thing. You can learn a lot of really good information on that. So what I'll do if I'm brewing a new style of beer is I'll just research it as much as I possibly can. Find two, three, four different sources, make sure that certain variables match up across those sources and try to replicate it as closely as possible. All styles of beer take different. For mash temperatures, there's different fermentation temperatures, there's different combinations of grains. If you want to be traditional, there's typically certain types of hops that go into those. I'm glad you said that. Has anybody seen hops or even smelled hops before it went into a boil or a beer? Brewery tour. Oh, yeah? Well, we're trying to do as much as we can to a brewery tour. I don't know if I really get that up. These are pelletized hops, so obviously they don't look like they do in the wild. This is kind of what they look like in the wild, but... These are what we use in our brewing process. They'll actually produce more of a, uh, they have more surface area, so you actually get more uh, efficiency out of pelletized hops than you do out of whole hops, which is what they call the wild ones when they come right off of the, the vine. So. Also, we didn't talk about this type of malt, which makes me want to go back a little bit. Uh, 99% of home brewers for their first beer are going to want to do an extract beer. Uh, an extract beer is literally how you're crushing your grains and you're doing your, your mash and trying to get all your sugars out. This will eliminate your brewing day down by an extra, you'll gain about four hours of your day doing a extract kit. Our average brew day, even for me at a home brewing in my garage before I went commercial, was between eight and 10 hours. It's an all day thing for me. You can knock one of these out in like three. It's a whole lot quicker. It's just as effective. These had many breweries and many homebrewers win competitions off extract beer kits, just as many as all grain uh, kits and recipes. Uh, this is like I said, this is just a fine dried malt extract. We have different ones. This one's actually for uh, an amber. So that'll give you that amber color to it. We've got some for ambers, we've got some for pilsner, we've got some for regular pale ale. You can get wheat, you can get dark malts like this. They come in this dry form. And one thing that we didn't have at the brewery that I normally don't carry, uh, but I have some a little bit there, I think still, is you can actually get liquid malt too. Uh, it comes in like a big can, big... Uh, it's like a syrup. Yeah, it pretty much looks like molasses or a syrup. Uh, the, the easiest way uh, on the process of that, we like I said, we went over the process of how to do an all grain beer. It's not a, it doesn't have to be that hard. You can eliminate mashing in, you can eliminate having to have a hot liquor tank. You can literally bring water up into your pot. Uh, the way most of them work is you put about three gallons and I think on this one it actually has, I don't know if you can see it on the outside, but on the inside there, it actually has your marks for your gallons in there as well. Basically what you're doing when you're using this kind of stuff is somebody's already done the mash process for you. Yeah. This is just grain sugar and you just have to start boiling it and go from there. Yeah. So, so it saves you a minimum of uh, two hours, but a maximum of however much longer. I mean, 
instead of having to do like a 60 minute boil on extracts, you can do a 30 minute boil and have all the sugars you need. And it's kind of a controversial subject. I mean, some people turn their nose up at brewing yeah. that way, but like he said, I would say just as many people win awards brewing with maltose as they do with whole, whole grains. So nobody can really tell the difference, I don't think. No, and then also they've got some that's called a partial mash. So say most of your uh, uh, malt's gonna be your dried malt or your liquid malt, but you're gonna have say maybe six or eight ounces of actual grain uh, in there that we have already pre-crushed up that we have these bags just way smaller than this. It almost looks like a, a, a mesh sock that you can put it in there and then you can just steep your grains in your water uh, that way. And then you can add in, bring it up to a boil and add in your malts and stuff like that. What's the benefit of doing that? Do you suppose just cost maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, grain actually hold. grain, yeah, for grain it's way cheaper. Like yeah. I was saying, uh, all grain kits are between 20 and 30 bucks is our average kits, depending on the hops and yeast that you want to use, that they vary. You go to extract, you're going to start floating around the $45, $50 per kit. Yeah. It's just more expensive to get in. It, like I said, it's an eliminating process and it's more expensive to get in and it's just more expensive to buy. And it's a processed product. Yeah. It's the old fry once, fry once thing. You know, if you want to, if you want to brew, if you're going to brew for a long time and a lot of beer, you want to go with it. Yeah. Uh, vessel. Mm -hmm. And if you just want to try it once, once or twice, yeah. Yeah. get the kit. You know? yeah. Yeah, and you don't have to do five gallons at a time. A lot of people do a gallon at a time just to try out a recipe and cut back on ingredient and cost yeah. and stuff like that too. Just scale it down. I have people come in all the time buying stuff for one gallon uh, kits. I've had people come in buying for three gallon kits. Uh, all it is is just scaling down. It's as simple as that. Instead of needing a full ounce of hops, you might only need a quarter ounce of hops or even less than that depending on how, how much you do. Uh, we got any uh, any other questions on process and stuff like that? How much time do we got, Matt? Was I think we're right about at it. Are we? Yep. Uh, oh, one thing I didn't hear you talk about was like trail thermometer, uh, uh, you know, for your alcohol. Oh yes. Oh, oh yeah. Bring one of those. Thank you for bringing that up. Why this wasn't put in basic equipment? I That's think it should be, but at the same time, it's not necessary unless you want to know pretty much how stout your beer is. So. This right here is called a hydrometer. It's a triple scale hydrometer. It reads three different scales on it. We only usually use one on there. And we use the scale here. Oh, let's see if I can put it in here so it don't get broke, but y'all can still kind of see it. Uh, there's a scale on here that says, this one actually says, uh, I don't know why it says desert wine. <laughs> uh, it's got your approximate, it's got your, uh, your bricks on there and then it's got your gravity on there. I couldn't remember what the third one was. Uh, but what you'll do in this process, say you've got your everything boiled, you got your wort boiled, you're about to go to the fermenter with it. You're going to want to get, uh, I've even used these tubes before, I would say I wouldn't use them but I had before not having one, but just get you a cup, a jar, if you want to spend the money and get you a, a, a test jar for a hydrometer that just sits in there. Uh, that's all you need. You'll just fill it up uh, to where your hydrometer itself isn't touching the bottom of your glass. And what it does, you'll drop it in there and wherever your wart lands on this scale right here kind of measures how much sugar's in your wart. And I'll, I'll pass this around. And this one right here is the one that I'm talking about. It reads from 0 0.009 or 0 0.000 all the way up to, I think, almost two. Uh, but what, there is, what we do with that like I said, it measures your ABV or your potential ABV in your beer. It's actually measuring the density of the liquid. So when you have the when you have your unfermented sugars in there, the liquid is actually more dense than it is after the fermentation process has produced alcohol from those sugars. Yeah. So yeah, not to interrupt you. No, there. no, you're good. You're good. And yeah, what he, what Matt was saying, it pretty much measures how much sugars you have starting and then finishing and. I was never smart enough to like try to do the conversion in my head. Now they have, <laughs> now they have apps that you can literally type in ABV calculator. All you have to do is write down your starting point on your wart, which is pre-fermentation. You'll just write that down somewhere on your bucket on a piece of paper, put it aside. And then as it ferments, and another thing good about having a spigot on your fermenter, 
you can actually test it as it's fermenting to kind of see how far it's went down. And you can also test it and see if it's done fermenting or not. So if you start to say like uh, an average beer, like uh, it would be a, say a 10.52, a 1.052. And once you see the, the hydrometer, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. It'll end up right there on that line and it'll say 1.052. It's by 2.2 increments, is that what it is, I think, or 0 0.02 increments? Yeah, on there, the lines. Two, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you'll just write that number down and then you'll go on to pitch your yeast and start your fermentation. Once you're, so once you don't see any more activity, what I say on your airlock, once you see it quit bubbling and it's been like two days and you haven't seen it bubble once, that's when I would take another reading with your hydrometer and uh, I would write that number down. And like I said, it's now they make it simple. I have an app on my phone that's just called a ABV Calculator. You'll type in that first one, that first number from your original gravity, and then you'll type in your final gravity. It'll say OG and FG on it. OG is original, FG is final. And literally just hit calculate and it'll tell you what your percentage is at the bottom. If it's 5.2, 6.1, whatever it is. Uh, like I said, when I first started brewing, I didn't even know what a hydrometer was. I just know, oh, well, it's bubbling. That means it's making alcohol. It's also a good way to know that your fermentation process is complete. If you get the same gravity reading throughout the course of two or three days, then you know that it's not consuming any more sugar. Yeah. So you're good to go with your conditioning or whatever the next step is for you for that beer. You would be surprised how many people come in and they're like, and bring me a sample. Hey, how much alcohol do you think this is in this? And I'm like, what was your original gravity? I don't test it. It's also temperature dependent <laughs> too. So, you know, you, I think most of the hydrometers are calibrated at around 69 or 70 degrees. Yeah. It'll get thrown off if you're taking, like, don't test it straight out of the boil or anything like that. Yeah. You want to test it around 69, 70 degrees. Yeah, if you try to test it right out of the boil, it won't be accurate. It won't break, it won't shatter or anything, but it won't be accurate. Definitely want to test it at room temperature right before you pitch your yeast. There's also another device you can use called a refractometer they will actually uh, determine your original gravity really well by the, uh, the amount of light that passes through the liquid. It'll show you, it's, a, it's hard to explain, but it's kind of like a tube that you look through and it will produce a line depending on how much sugar is in there and how much light it's allowing to pass through that liquid. So that'll give you a good original gravity or if you wanna get what they call a pre-boil gravity to make sure that you had extracted enough sugars from your grain to produce the alcohol that you want yes, at the end product. Um, but it's not very good for getting uh, your final gravity. For whatever reason, the alcohol throws off that yeah. refraction of that light passing through that liquid. So I would stick with a hydrometer personally. That's what I've always yeah, used. Yeah, that's what we so. use at the brewery is a hydrometer. I mean, we have refractometers to test, like you said, pre-boil gravities and stuff. But we don't try to get our actual, read our ABVs off a refractometer. Mm. We always use the hydrometer. So. But uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I totally didn't see it sitting over here. And I know I brought it for a reason. <laughs> but uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, that we can answer for you guys? If y'all got anything about, even if it's a little bit more technical, y'all might have a question. Y'all can totally ask. We don't mind answering. And if, if you're not, just getting into it, there's a lot of different resources online that you can, uh, for you to help you build your recipe. I use Brewer's Friend. What's the one you use? Uh, Brew Father. Brew Father. They're uh, programs that you can input your grain into. It'll tell you what uh, the projected ABV, uh, the IBUs, things like that will be when it comes out. So that's what I would recommend. Just kind of find one that you like and start fiddling with it and seeing the, the basic process of building a recipe. Or if you want to come by the brewery, we'll have hook you up. We'll help you go through the whole process and build your recipe straight from scratch. So. Yeah, a lot of people do do that. Uh, a lot of people come in. We do have a book of recipes as well uh, that a lot of people like to go through and they'll see some stuff on there that I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. Uh, you know, uh, this, this brown ale maybe that'll be interesting i've never had one you might want to try something like that but we've got a bunch of recipes there and like you said we can build them by by hand if you come in and say i want a hazy ipa recipe we'll sit there right with you and we'll build up what flavor profiles y'all want you know do y'all want it to be fruity do you want it to be this do you want it to be that do you want it to look like an orange juice you know <laughs> anything and we, we can sit there and build it for you 
Yeah, and we got 12 taps. If you like one of the beers on tap, we can go ahead and build you a recipe based on that too. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, we've, I, I've been trying to get well, like some of the recipes out of our book and brewing them, so they, some of the recipes are on tap at the brewery. So in case you're wondering what that beer would taste like, that recipe, every once in a while we'll have one of those up on the, on the board to try, like I did a Saison earlier this year, and it's actually one of our recipe kits, and it, it, people seem to like it, and I've sold a couple of kits because they actually tried it, never had a Saison, tried it, and they were like, oh, this isn't bad, and I want to try to you know, brew a Saison, so things like that so uh, if nobody has any questions or anything uh, I think that it's gonna conclude our class so we appreciate everybody for coming out today definitely do we're really trying to get the homebrew community built back up uh, I, it's kind of I wouldn't say faded off but it seems like since uh, since COVID's kind of tapered off a little bit more people's going out and not staying at home brewing anymore uh, so it seems like the homebrew scene's still here but it's still the it's like the same 30 guys, you know, and we're trying to keep building it back up. Uh, we've been trying to get a lot more uh, women in there too, kind of diversified a little bit more because they bring certain things to the table that us men wouldn't even think about, you know. Yeah, Stuff this like was that, a so. female dominated industry for thousands of years. Yeah. The classic imagery of a witch comes from brewing. Yep. You had a couple up here. You had that girl that helped set up JJ's. Yep. Set up like 56 breweries. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't be where I'm at right now if it wasn't for my wife. She's the one that pushed me to do this. So I, I pretty much, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I, I pretty much owe her for all that too. She pushed us to uh, purchase the homebrew store, and uh, our goal before even the homebrew store was she's like wanted me to push to try to do a brewery of my own. And so she's, you know, getting with Matt is kind of one of the things that she pushed me to do, and now it's kind of come to fruition. So. I, I owe her a lot for that. I think it's neat that the actual brewery, you know, is, is, is hosting some of this. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, the best way, you know, for the, <clears throat> like to come up to the brewery and, you know, check it out when you're, when you're brewing. Absolutely. Yeah, we're uh, open every day except Sunday and Monday, so if you ever make it up here, give us a call and one of us will make sure we're there and show yeah. you around and give you a little tour of the, the brewing area in the back and Absolutely. kind of the process and yeah kind of seeing it in person besides seeing it on a screen it is kind of two different things for sure uh, yeah this is a lot of information to absorb for sure and that's just kind of scraping the surface so yeah you were talking enzymes earlier mm -hmm. off yep Fermentation. Fermentation. I uh, occasionally it'll happen. I've had more homebrew probably problems than I do with the professional equipment, but yeah, that's something. The temperature of your mash is very critical for sure. You don't want to mash too high of a temperature unless you're going for a low ABV. ABV, yeah, basically it's a good good rule to follow. Distilling side, alpha amylase will help a lot on that. It, Especially if you're going to do a sugar wash, sure. sugar, sugar mash rather, and uh, or even sometimes the meats mm -hmm. uh, help uh, it ferment out. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. It, it needs the nutrients. Absolutely. It have it from a, and it has trouble with those longer chain sugars as well. For whatever reason, the yeast hasn't been cultivated to consume those as efficiently, which is good. I mean, you want it. You want that sugar to be present in some styles of beer. So it gives you that variable the variation to mess around with. So, but yeah, you ferment at 104. I mean, you mash it at 140 compared to 158 and it's, it's a world of difference. So, yeah. And I, just, let, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No. Uh, the brew supply down there isn't just beer. A lot of people think that we carry everything that you need to make beer, cider, mead, and wine. It's, we don't just carry stuff for beer, to let a lot of people know that. Uh, you know, a lot of people like, we don't know where to get supplies for wines and stuff. We carry supplies for wines, we carry supplies for meads and stuff like that. Uh, we don't carry bulk honey. Uh, when we first uh, took over the supply side, we brought in some honey, but uh, it, it just didn't sell very well. Not a lot of people are coming in looking for it, uh, but stuff like that. We do have. Uh, wine kits there. We also have, uh, I believe we have a couple of solder kits. We have some seltzer kits and then we have uh, wine bases as well where you can build up 
you know, different like strawberry wine base where it makes five gallons of strawberry wine and stuff like that. It's not just secluded to just beer. Uh, a lot of people have asked me that. Or do you carry things for besides stuff for beer? Yes, we do. We carry the Amelie's enzyme. We carry stuff like that, you know, bentonite, magnesiums, whatever. You know, we, we, we carry as much as we can. So it's not just subjective to just beer. Yeah, I carry uh, I carry daddy yeast and turbo yeasts and stuff like that. And yeah, I know nobody likes it, but I carry it. So, <laughs> uh, is there any any other question? Oh, do what? Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, is there, is there any stuff. other questions for anybody? Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah we appreciate y'all guys for coming out. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Absolutely.